Hi, everyone, and thanks for spending some time with me today talking about DevOps and particularly how DevOps is changing the way that, that IT works. I'm really excited to be uh, talking to you more about this today. So a little bit about me, Rebecca explained that. I am the author of the Agile Service Management Guide. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I serve as the track chair for some of the international co uh, conferences. But what I really want to tell you about just at the start is a little bit about the DevOps Institute. So we pride ourselves on being the continuous learning community. We want learning to be a lifestyle for IT professionals. We want to be able to give our members access to innovative, inspirational content, courses, certification. And we work through a really trusted a channel of registered education partners such as DDLS. So very excited to be working with them, very excited with uh, collaboration, but most importantly, really excited to be connecting with the attendees who are part of our continuous learning community. So let's start with a common definition of DevOps. So we know that there are lots of def different definitions of DevOps. And if you ask any individual, they'll likely come up with the spirit of the one that's grown organically through Wikipedia, which is that DevOps is first and foremost a cultural and professional movement. It does stress communication. It does stress collaboration. It does stress integration between developers and operation professionals. But it also puts an, a very heavy emphasis on the automation of software delivery and infrastructure changes. So it is truly the marriage of, of people, process, and technology, something that we've been working towards for a very, very long time in IT. It does look at building a culture. And so we're going to talk a little bit today also about culture and how difficult it is sometimes to change the culture inside of an organization, almost more difficult than introducing more technology or uh, practices like continuous delivery um, and continuous integration. We want the environment to really be where building, testing, and releasing software can happen very rapidly, can happen very frequently, and most importantly, very reliably. Uh, Jez Humble, uh, you might know that, uh, Jez Humble's name. He is the author of the Continuous Delivery book, uh, really known as, as one of the founders of the Continuous Delivery uh, set of practices. And he says that releases should be boring. Right, releases should be able to happen in the middle of the afternoon in a production environment, and they should be very predictable and boring. And, and that's part of the spirit behind DevOps. And one of the reasons that DevOps, I think, has gained the kind of attention that it has um, in an international IT presence, because we're all trying to have very, very boring releases, which means they're predictable, there's no drama, uh, they happen automatically, and uh, human beings are you know are able to do higher level thinking and problem solving which is what human beings uh, does the best so let's talk a little bit about why devops is important now so when we start to think of kind of the evolution of devops and you know call it whatever you want i mean some people don't like the label of whether it's devops or ITIL or agile or any of the other frameworks that we uh, that we integrate into our it practices but why is DevOps particularly important now? Why is it important that the flow from uh, development into operations through security, through QA is important now? Well, I think the main reason it's important is to look at the landscape of competition. So if you look at legacy organizations, and as Rebecca said, I've been in IT a really long time. And so if you start to look at legacy organizations and, and their flow and how their organizations are built from a silo perspective, from a competency perspective, their competitors today are very young startups. And a young startup might be a kid in a garage uh, writing you know, the next big app. Uh, you know, they call it the Uber syndrome for a reason. The next competitor could be a, a startup coming out of any of the pockets of technology around the world. But competition is different today. Competition is unknown. Competition is very, very disruptive. And in order to compete, enterprises must put emphasis on their ability to go faster. 
right? To bring products to market faster, to bring value to customers faster. Agile software development has certainly gained a lot of prominence from a development practice perspective. So we've moved from waterfall development, which is very sequential, to agile software, uh, agile software development, which is very iterative. The move to the cloud has certainly uh, influenced the need to be able to go faster and the need to be able to stand up infrastructure very quickly in a virtualized environment. So the net result is IT can no longer operate in a silo culture. And again, looking at the history of IT from when I started a long time ago to now, we grew up as an organization of specialists. We grew up in a, as an organization where all the developers on a particular team reported to a, a line manager and all the QA people uh, reported to their manager and all the security people had their teams and their management. And a lot of downstream activities occurred before a, a product or a piece of code could go into production. And that's not really sustainable anymore, right? We need to have cross-functionality. We need to have, I'll talk a little bit in a bit about T-shaped people. We need to really change the dynamic within the IT organization so that we can change the dynamic outside the IT organizations. So your consumers, whether you have business consumers, your B2B or your B2C, everyone today has an app mentality. You look at your phone and, and your apps magically update. There isn't a lot of drama associated with it. There isn't a lot of pre-announcement associated with it. It just happens kind of auto-magically. And so the expectation of the consuming uh, public whether again they're B2C or they're B2B, is almost automatical where again updates and new releases happen behind the scenes and the expectation is that reliability, sustainability, and new functionality will happen without a whole lot of, of interaction between the user and the system. The other influence today is data. So we have a lot more data available and that data comes up much more quickly than before. So the business can shift or pivot its approach or its intent or its need to deliver value um, as quickly as the data is available. And again, data can be available at the speed of, of uh, most systems. So at the end of the day, the reason DevOps is important now is that time to market has to increase. And we're even stopping from using the term time, time to market. We now use the term time to value, right? Time when we start a project or we start developing a piece of software to when it actually de de uh, delivers value to the end user. And so time to value has to increase because if you're not delivering value to your customer, somebody else is going to be able to do that. So in order to meet these changing conditions, IT has to adapt a new approach. And part of that new approach is not just how much open source software can we string together into some type of a pipeline. A lot of that approach is cultural, right? Breaking down the silos, looking at cross functionality, and also looking at grooming and skilling IT professionals to be able to adapt to the digital age. At the end of the day, we just have to be more continuous. And of course, that's part of the mantra of DevOps. So let's talk a little bit about why DevOps is so unique. And, and this is a question I get very frequently. Is it better than Scrum or better than cybersecurity or better than Lean or ITIL or organizational change management? Is it better than tools or technology and automation, right? Does it supersede any of these frameworks, any of these practices, any of the investments that your organization may have made over the past 5, 10, 15 years in order to improve its ability to, to deliver? And the answer is no, right? DevOps is not better than Scrum or better than cybersecurity or Lean or ITIL or cultural or technology. DevOps actually connects the dots between everything that IT has invested in so far. Right? It connects the dots between the output of a Scrum team and the input into a continuous delivery automation pipeline. It connects the dots between human teams, some of which are very specialty focused, again, like Scrum teams, which are mostly developers, and infrastructure teams, which are mostly operations. So it connects the dots, it builds bridges between those teams as well. It leverages practices like lean. Uh, we talk about value stream mapping. We talk about, from an ITIL perspective, change management or agile service management. And it places a strong emphasis on culture, which organizational change management has been struggling with for a very long time to improve the cultural relationship 
within IT and outside of IT with its business customers. So it's not unique. It doesn't supersede any of these practices. DevOps builds a bridge between them. So I like to think of it as the sum of its parts, right? DevOps, you can call it a movement, a philosophy, a framework, a set of practices. However you perceive DevOps, it does build bridges and may be the culmination of everything that we've invested in from a skilling and automation, right? People process and technology up until, up until now. So one of the things I think that DevOps do, does very well is it encourages systems thinking. So in a typical IT organization, we are so singularly focused on our stage of the software delivery life cycle that sometimes we um, don't necessarily see the entire picture. We don't necessarily see outside of the work that our, we and our teams do. And so DevOps really encourages us to think about the entire system from end to end and not only what role do we or our teams or our skills play in that system but also what are the downstream implications what are the downstream applications what's the downstream automation that we need to be able to consider as we move down the entire system uh, you know devops is very much founded on the, the concept of the theory of constraints where if your system has a constraint it will only be as successful as that constraint so if you look at this image you start to see the people process and automation elements of devops and instead of talking about a service life cycle or a, a service delivery software delivery life cycle we start now to talk about value streams right as i said before this is all about delivering value to customers and in order to deliver value to customers we have to have the right culture and we have to have the integration of all of these different process frameworks and we also need to have automation that helps do repetitive tasks consistent tasks produces evidence and moves the the product downstream through the um, through the pipeline much much faster there's a concept in DevOps called shift left, where we shift left a lot of the processes and the practices earlier in the value stream. But nonetheless, we are trying to increase the flow of the value stream and eliminate waste. So if we're going to have systems thinking, we also have to understand that the system is always is only going to be as successful as its weakest link. I just mentioned the theory of constraints. So if you look at this landscape, and I'm not going to go through every single aspect of this, but you know, it can be a little daunting. We start to look at agile software development in the upper left and, and that iterative approach that's supported through Scrum, right? So Scrum events, sprints, uh, the ability to do retrospectives, daily standups, and then the output of potentially shippable product that comes out of the scrum teams needs to then go into some type of a release process. Now, it may be a manual release process where downstream it goes through security testing and it goes through QA and it goes through building and it, and it goes through staging before it's released into production. In DevOps, we want to be able to move those activities further left so that they happen earlier in the value stream and they also happen much more frequently and with the use of automation. So the shift left approach is very much supported in continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And here you can see the aspects of IT service management, you can see the aspects of Scrum, and then the button is pressed or the button presses itself and we continuously deliver or deploy into production. And then there are other processes and practices that kick into, into place like service level management, incident management, problem management, knowledge management, and some of the aspects of post-production work. Um, if you've not heard yet about site reliability engineering, I would encourage you to do some research about that. It is a very new and modern approach uh, to post-production operations. It is very much about engineering for operations as well. And we'll be looking at site reliability engineering very, very closely this year. So DevOps is based on the three ways. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard the book about the book, The Phoenix Project. If you've not read it yet, I would encourage you to read it. It's a very enjoyable read. It's a novel. Um, so you recognize the characters. If you've been in any type of an IT environment, you probably recognize yourself. 
Um, you might actually guess who you are and you might actually miss who you are. We have uh, kind of fun debates about who we think we are in terms of the book. And it's, it's more like a fable, right? A fable with a moral to the story um, in terms of, of what, to, what actually occurs in an IT environment. But at the heart of it, the Phoenix Project really emphasizes three ways of DevOps. So again, if you're not familiar with it, I'll give you a very high over, uh, level overview. Some organizations have built, built uh, book clubs around the Phoenix Project. So they've had teams read it together and then um, kind of discuss through it. The first way is about flow. So as I said, the flow from left to right, from development into continuous delivery and into post-production, um, if we can overcome constraints, if we can uh, eliminate waste, then that flow will be faster and certainly much more frequent. The second way is to encourage shortened feedback loops. So in a waterfall environment, at the, um, at the end of the waterfall, at the bottom of the waterfall, there is user acceptance testing, there's certainly feedback, but it occurs right before production. And so in an agile environment, the feedback loop is, is much shorter because it likely occurs at the end of a sprint. So in DevOps, uh, the second way, what we're trying to do is build in shortened feedback loops where you're not only getting feedback from your customers or your teams, you're getting feedback from others that are involved in the software delivery process or the value stream. The third way to me is the most interesting. The third way is to encourage experimentation. So in DevOps, we talk a lot about doing experiments, right? Using scientific methods to test your hypothesis in a, in a smart, intelligent, and fairly safe way so that you can be disruptive, you can use the human capabilities of higher level thinking, and you can experiment and practice in order to become masters. So learning is also a key element of the third way. It's a key element of DevOps. That's why DevOps Institute uh, considers itself to be the continuous learning community. The third way encourages a culture that really fosters the ability to take intelligent risks and to learn from failure. Uh, you might have heard of the chaos monkey that Netflix originally introduced. If you haven't, I would encourage you to research it, but they actually have a demon that runs around their systems, their live production systems and randomly shuts stuff off, right? Randomly disrupts their systems so that they can practice failing, right? They can practice how to recover from a failure. They can identify opportunities for redundancy. So in the third way, we understand that until we can actually repeat the process of recovering from failure, that we can practice an experiment that's really the prerequisite to becoming a master, right? You can write all the plans you want, you can, you can uh, hypothesize all you want, but until you actually do experiments, small experiments, intelligent experiments, um, you're not actually able to move from the environment you're in potentially to the environment that you want to be in. So DevOps also has a set of values. And when we start to look at the acronym COMS, culture, automation, lean measurement and sharing, we understand that DevOps is not about one thing. That's why at the DevOps Institute, we do not encourage a single body of knowledge around DevOps. I, I know that's frustrating to many of you because in several of the other frameworks do have a, a, a single body of knowledge like the ITIL library or the Scrum Guide or the PMBOK if you're if you're uh, doing any kind of PMI project management. In DevOps, DevOps is so broad, the system is so broad and touches so many different aspects of IT that it's difficult to encapsulate it into a single set of values or even a single body of, of knowledge. But each of these values represents some area that IT should focus on. So it can't only be about automation, right? You can't only start with Jenkins, add a bunch of plugins, add a bunch of APIs, and suddenly deem yourself as having successful DevOps. You can't only have culture, right? We need to be able to automate ourselves as much as we automate the rest of the world. Um, you can't only look at waste, right? You might, you might eliminate so much waste that what you're hoping in efficiencies actually becomes inefficient. Metrics are important and certainly knowledge sharing is important. And each of these plays a, a role as an ingredient in the recipe that, that you know, we've labeled as DevOps. So you know, there's a multiple focus and, and again, a little bit of all of these is better than a whole lot of one. 
So how does DevOps change the way um, IT works? And I think this is really interesting. So, you know, uh, sorry, pun intended, but if anyone attending today is at all a Game of Thrones fan, then you'll, you'll understand the image on the left, right? Sometimes IT is like the seven kingdoms where each of the practice and frameworks have loyalists, each of them almost have armies, and they're all competing to sit on the Iron Throne. If you're not a Game of Thrones fan still, I'm hoping that the image of this will bring up the fact that there's a lot of territorial um, approaches within IT where, again, we're loyal to a particular set of practices or we're loyal to a particular team. And, and somewhere along the way, we want our set of practices or our framework to be the magic bullet that improves end-to-end, -end, the end-to-end -end IT system. At the end of the day, what we really want is each of these practices side by side traveling on the same road. And then, you know, again, analogy intended, uh, crossing the same bridge. So we need to move away from that territorial approach where we have kingdoms or queendoms or however you want to approach that. And we start to really look at how do we operate side by side and take the best of the best practices and build them into a custom, a custom framework for ourselves. And so if you're going to change the way IT work, you have to start with people. And you have to realize that we talk a lot about cultural transformation. Well, culture doesn't transform, people transform. And people only transform when they're inspired to do so. So transformational leadership, which has emerged as a key DevOps practice, is really a model in which leaders inspire. They motivate their followers to achieve higher performance. They appeal to their values and sense of purpose. Right? They reach inside and appeal to not only the what's in it to me, but how can we work together to achieve a common goal. And transformational leadership is a new set of skills um, for the traditional leader because, again, being an inspirational leader, having a toolkit to be able to motivate people is something that's necessary if you're going to overcome cultural challenges, right? They encourage their teams to work towards this common goal. They set examples, they communicate well, right? They show caring about people, they address their, their followers' personal needs. Again, they, they answer the question, what's in it for me? At, while at the same time, they're building a common mindset that we're all in this together. So what's in it for me? How do we do this together is very, very much a part of the way that uh, DevOps encourages cultural change. Now, this is, this is actually my favorite part of what's going on in the DevOps space. So I'm going to take a minute or two and just um, talk to this. I'm not sure if you've heard of this concept of T-shaped people, but let me step back a little bit and in time and, and share, share how we are where we are today. So if you kind of think of IT as a tree where there's a main trunk and the main trunk is technology, right? We need to deliver technology to our <clears throat> business customers and ultimately to our organizations and customers. We built IT from that tree with a bunch of branches, some of which don't see each other, right? And each of those branches represent a specialty. So I'm a developer, you're a QA person, you're a security professional, I'm an infrastructure uh, architect, I'm an enterprise architect, I'm a fill in the blank. And so each of us have, have achieved within IT some specialty that's our designation. And most of the time we hang around people that have the same specialty that we are and we're organized within IT to report into a manager who understands or has the same specialty skill that we have. But we're pretty much a one skill, one specialty. We may have some broad understanding of, of other things, but, but we're being paid, we're hired to do a very specialist job. Well, when we, so that's depth of knowledge. When we start to look at the evolution in the digital age and we start to look at reskilling, um, which is a very, very strong movement within DevOps is to do skills modernization programs uh, within enterprises, we now need professionals who have a specialty, but also have a broad base of knowledge about other competencies. So let's take testing as an example to that. So if you're a developer, going forward, you're going to need to be a test-driven developer, which means you're going to write your test cases before you write your first line of code. 
And that testing may include some security testing. It may include certainly unit testing. Um, it may include uh, integration testing or functional testing. But you're going to need to have more than a light understanding of testing. You're going to have to write test cases, right? Test-driven development is a highly desirable, highly employable skill for the modern developer. If you're an infrastructure person, you probably need to develop some testing skills as well. So we're going to move from an I-shaped specialist to a T-shaped professional who has a core competency, but also has enough skill, enough competency in other disciplines in order to be able to take their skill to the next level, right? To groom their skill up to the next level. And then the evolution from there is maybe you end up with two specialties or three specialties, but still your broad-based knowledge keeps growing and growing and growing. So we break down the silos by having teams of T-shaped individuals. And so depending on where you are in your skilling, I would encourage you to look at other skills outside your primary discipline and learn more about that. And I'm, I'm not talking about learning it in terms of what it is. It's learning it in terms of how it's done. Um, and again, you don't need depth of knowledge, but you certainly do need breadth of knowledge. And this will become probably the most hireable individuals will be those that are T-shaped and beyond. So learning as a lifestyle, you know, as I, I mentioned before, DevOps is so broad. And so being able to capture everything that DevOps is into a single body of knowledge, whether it's a single library written by pairs of authors like the ITIL library, or it's a, um, a guide that's a, 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 a starting place for you like the Scrum Guide, or it's a roadmap or a reference architecture that's given to you by one of the partners or providers, each of those uh, focus on a specific area of DevOps. And so at DevOps Institute, we've coined the term collective body of knowledge. And so if you look at how people learn today, right? And, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a millennial first entering into the marketplace, but if you look at how learning happens today, it happens in a lot of different ways. It certainly happens in a classroom partially because of the, the need to have an instructor and a, um, a collated course, right? A course that makes sense of the wide variety of practices. But the other reason being in a classroom is important is that you get to hear and share with other people, either from within your organization or, or outside your organization in order to solve problems. So certainly classroom training is here to stay. But we now learn through videos, we now learn through conferences, we now learn through blogs and, and articles, certainly we still learn through books, we learn through case studies, and certainly we learn from thought leaders. So in order to capture everything that's culture and automation and metrics and um, sharing and three ways and ITSM and agile, it would be impossible. Um, first of all, it'd be impossible to put it into a single body of knowledge it would also be impossible to maintain it. We don't even use the term best practices anymore. We use the term emerging practices because some of the practices that are emerging in DevOps are emerging in case studies or presentations. Uh, a good example is the concept of a dojo where organizations are creating these nurture, um, I call them nurture nests. They've, they've created environments where teams are nurtured by agile coaches or DevOps coaches. But I, I hope you embrace the concept of a, of a collective body of knowledge because there are places like devops.com where you can read blogs and articles and, and uh, view webinars. There certainly are uh, conferences, uh, DevOps days, other conferences around the world. And then there's training. And, and again, in a reskilling environment, and maybe the word reskilling is inappropriate, skills modernization environment, right? we want to be able to take advantage of that as well. So embrace the emerging practices. And so here are some key ones. Value stream mapping. So um, if you're going to understand the value stream, then you, whoever you are, inside of your organization with your teams, should learn how to map your value stream. And so mapping the value stream is essentially building a pipeline of everything that occurs from concept to value creation and all of the activities that occur in between all of the different teams all of the different 
processes, practices, automation that are associated with it. It's a really fantastic exercise, mostly done, by the way, with post-it notes, right? So again, if you're interested in learning more about value stream mapping, I encourage you to do that. But how can you know how you create value if you don't understand um, the, the, um, the stream that occurs? And um, potentially identify opportunities for ways. So I would encourage you to learn a little bit more about value stream mapping. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Um, again, the mantra that we need to be continuous. Um, if you're not familiar with these, the continuous delivery publication by Jess Humble is certainly um, a good starting place. These are also introduced in the DevOps Foundation course, so you get a high-level understanding of what they are. But essentially, they are the three areas of, of uh, software delivery, we'll call them release, um, release management or release engineering, that starts with the integration of code from multiple programmers that are built and tested together through the pipeline that ultimately takes that, um, that piece of software or product into production. Site reliability engineering, I'm not going to tell you a lot about it today, but I would tell you to stay tuned. So, um, so several folks from Google wrote a book called Site Reliability Engineering in terms of how Google keeps its environment stable and, and of course, reliable. And it introduced some new practices. It introduced the concept of engineering for operations, the same way that we engineer for continuous delivery. Grew up actually outside of DevOps, but certainly is parallel. Uh, particularly from the post-production operations uh, space. So we'll be spending a lot of time this year at DevOps Institute really collecting some of the emerging practices in site reliability engineering and bringing that forward. Automated testing or continuous testing. This is the one skill, if I had to encourage everybody in IT to acquire a new skill, this would be it. You heard me mention it before. So automated testing, continuous testing has to be very pervasive throughout the continuous delivery pipeline, right? From when a product um, starts being developed, for, right? Test-driven development all the way through and beyond its deployment into production. So we call it automated testing. You might hear it called continuous testing, but it's really taking various types of tests, right? So it isn't a single type of test and really integrating it earlier in the value stream. So looking at security testing, certainly unit testing, functional testing, integration testing, um, and then also getting your evidence, your compliance evidence out of the results of the test. If it doesn't turn green, right, doesn't pass green, it goes back a step um, in the pipeline. If, um, if it's green, then it moves forward down the, down the pipeline as well. And, and the reason this is so important is story after story about organizations that introduced agile software development and you know, did a two or four week sprint and two months later, the product hadn't gone into production because of some of the downstream testing um, practices from that organization. So this is a skill, really understanding testing. I think that's gonna be critical to everyone. DevSecOps is the integration of security into DevOps. It's a very, very hot topic. Uh, there are DevSecOps days that are going to start to emerge over the next year. There are certainly uh, conferences, white papers, ebooks that have been developed about DevSecOps. Some feel that when DevOps was coined um, about six, seven years ago, security was left out of the equation and now very much has to be the center. Uh, in a very, very cyber risk world. So I would encourage you to look into DevSecOps's world. And then ChatOps, one of my favorites. So ChatOps Slack, if you use Slack, is very much a ChatOps tool where you not only get to chat, but you can bring your environment into the chat and you can bring in schedules and you can bring in code and you can look at things collaboratively regardless of whether you sit across the aisle from each other or across the world. So automation, you know, I've mentioned it before, you really can't do this without automation. This is a um, fairly random sampling of some of the more prominent of the tools within the DevOps space. There are hundreds and hundreds of DevOps tools, which could be a little bit mind blowing. But on the other hand, if you start to look at reference architectures and start to look at you know, step one, start looking at a continuous integration platform, right, and then grow your way forward, 
Um, open source doesn't always mean free, right? There's work that's associated with it. And many of these tools have uh, enterprise versions as well. But you might be familiar, Puppet and Chef, certainly configuration, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, Red Hat, uh, GitHub is a source code repository, CA, which is uh, you know doing quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, DevOps functionality, they they have testing functionality, release functionality. CloudBees Jenkins uh, is a platform upon which many organizations build their continuous delivery and so on and so forth. You can't do it only, you can't buy your way into DevOps, right? That's part of the DevOps on steroids. You can't buy your way into DevOps by acquiring tools, but you certainly do need tools because it, it is time for IT to automate itself. So I've told you a lot, and I apologize if I've gone very fast and really thrown a lot of different concepts out of you. My hope is that tonight, uh, well, actually this morning for you, um, that you're getting a little bit of a taste of some of the emerging practices that are really starting to deliver value inside of real organizations. And so if I had to really kind of fine tune it into what's the one critical step that successful organizations, and there are organizations all over the world that are, are presenting video case studies, that are talking about what they're doing, whether it's at conferences or whether it's at webinars or whether it's in written case studies. But if I had to really kind of align, what's the one thing that these organizations are doing? It's that they're starting to think like a startup because your competitor is thinking like a startup, right? I, I learned a new word recently, intrapreneurship, right? That's where a, an, a legacy organization or an enterprise really establishes a startup mentality, even within a single team, even within a single unit, but, but they encourage that unit to think like a startup, to budget like a startup, to organize like a startup, really to build this kind of of culture and automation and process into their team's DNA. And so again, it's not easy to get people to think like a startup, but certainly I think, you know, that's a good, that's a good way to start. Other things that you can do, um, first step, start a value stream mapping exercise. Learn a little bit about value stream mapping. There's some education on the way about it. Um, there's certainly some good presentations and books about it, um, but, sit down with your teams and, and hopefully a good cross section of IT and just take a bunch of sticky notes, get a blank wall and, and start mapping your value stream, all of the activities that it takes to bring software into production. Design cross-functional squads. We're moving away from the word team uh, based on um, a, a model that comes out of Spotify and starting to move into squads with different shaped people, right? So I shaped to T shaped type of, of people. Build training and communication plans, right? Help your, your individuals inside your squads um, modernize their skills, acquire new skills, become T-shaped people. Encourage this culture of frequent feedback, culture, collaboration, and learning, right? Crowdsource a common taxonomy. I can't encourage this enough. One of the biggest issues we have in IT is we have so many acronyms and so many different names for the same thing that sometimes we're saying the same thing and we don't understand it. So start building a common taxonomy inside your own organization that may be adapted from ITIL and Agile and DevOps and automation and proprietary frameworks so that your language is, is a unique language and everybody speaks it and everybody understands what it means. Agree on your blended process, avoid handoffs, really look at, at better flows, look at APIs not only between your tools, but between your frameworks, right? Change management is a great example of that. Look at ways that you could scale your change management process if it's a constraint for you so that more of your changes are actually considered standard and they don't need to be approved by a change advisory board, but they could be considered pre-approved and, and you can define what that level is right? Automate repetitive tasks and then share your accountabilities and metrics. We all win together or we, um, or we learn together, right? We don't fail together. You know, in, in DevOps, we like to say, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Build common metrics so that we understand when we succeed, why we succeed, and how we can use that data. 
And then, of course, you know, encourage everybody to learn something new. It is very much human beings must move forward. And so part of it is really kind of moving into, um, you know, that next forward state. And then experiment, continually improve, and learn. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about courses. I, I think I'm still doing okay on, on time, Rebecca. So, um, you know, in our partnership with uh, DDLS, um, we've introduced uh, DevOps Institute again. We're not, uh, uh, we're an accreditation body. So uh, as part of our, our uh, goal to be the continuous learning community, we have created certifications at multiple levels. Um, looking at DevOps Foundation as broad-based, it's meant for everyone. So it's not too much technology or too much culture or too much idle and agile. It's just enough. And so if you're looking to learn more uh, in depth about these emerging practices, DevOps Foundation is a great course to work with DDLS on. It is also the prerequisite for some of the upcoming courses like DevOps Leader, uh, which is very specific to uh, leading DevOps. A couple of other courses that I really want to uh, call out, uh, and, and I take, uh, to be transparent, um, I take a lot of pride in these. I am the author of the Agile Service Management Guide. So from my, um, from my bio, you might have seen that I've got a little bit of a history in the ITIL and IT service management space. And so part of my relationship or my goals for DevOps is to really integrate a lot of the great processes out of the ITSM um, you know, out of the ITSM roadmap and enable them to be part of the value stream. So Agile Service Manager is not uh, specifically about individual process, but it is about designing ITSM processes to be more agile, taking very much as a, an approach uh, similar to what software developers do in developing software and applying many of the concepts from uh, Scrum, and then, uh, you know, a, a build on that, although not a prerequisite, is Agile Process Owner. So um, if you come at all from the ITSM space, we've really never taught process owners how to own process. And so in an Agile environment, software development, DevOps environment, owning process in a modern age has become a bigger challenge than ever. And so Agile Process provides a toolkit, very prescriptive toolkit, for being able to manage a process in the same way that product owners uh, manage products. Uh, so um, I hope you'll take advantage of, of those and, and be proud of your certifications, right? This is very much a, a time of reskilling and, and each of these gives the individual and the organization an opportunity to evolve skills. So on that note, Rebecca, I'm going to turn it back to you, and I would love if you would talk about your next course dates and, and about DDLS, and then let's take some questions. Sure. Thanks so much for that, Jane. So our next course dates, guys, are actually in Perth and Sydney. Um, obviously, the first one is on the 23rd um, to the 28th of March. Um, and then our second course that we've got scheduled is on the 6th to the 8th of June in Sydney. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to be running any other courses in any other states. Um, if you are interested and the state's not actually listed on the screen at the moment, please do get in touch with us um, or your account manager um, and we'll definitely get that, um, you know, the ball rolling on there. So the more interest that we actually find um, from the other states, we'll get that um, rolling. So um, I think what we might do now, Jane, is a, there's a few more um, questions that are coming through. So um, let's start off with um, one of the questions that we actually have here today is, um, so does DevOps align with the other current certifications such as ITIL, for example? Absolutely, a absolutely. So let me use an example of, of change management. So, um, so change, I get asked about change management more than any other process. And so if we start to look at ITIL processes, change management, incident management, problem management, service level management in particular, release management, um, you know, uh, continuous delivery is release management. Until we have that kind of cross knowledge about what those processes are, what the intent of those processes are, and how we can align those processes 
in order to enable a faster flow, then we'll be at a deficit because, again, understanding that release management and continuous delivery, if we keep them separate from each other, then we're not optimizing the value of both, of both set of practices. If we understand IT service management, and again, think about that, the management of services and all of the processes associated with it, I think DevOps, whatever your DevOps initiative will be, will go a lot better. Great, thank you so much for that, Jane. Um, Thomas, just to answer your question in regards to if we're gonna have a course down in Melbourne or remote um, to Sydney from the Melbourne office, um, let's uh, take that offline and we'll come back to you shortly and let you know that. Um, but in terms of other questions, guys, if you pop them into the question and answer panel, we can address them there or else um, just pop them into the chat panel as well. Jane, there's one more question that I do have for you. And um, that is, would DevOps still work with the traditional waterfall projects? So that's an interesting question. And so there's been um, a lot of discussion and, and debate about it. So. Let's, let's look at the heart of DevOps, right? So at the heart of DevOps, it's about development and operations working more closely together. Certainly, it is an evolution of agile, right? Where organizations started to do much more frequent releases. And because they were doing much more frequent releases, the need to have a faster release process, which is really continuous delivery, um, became necessary. So we needed to be able to automate releases. We needed to be able to test earlier in the value stream. And so certainly there is a close relationship between agile um, software development and DevOps. Now let's look at Waterfall. Mm -hmm. So Waterfall is a much more linear approach where um, you know stepping down the waterfall occurs in a very kind of methodical way. Well, there's nothing to say that the waterfall can potentially have some of the activities that happened further down the waterfall happen further up the waterfall, right? So if waterfall development is still a part of your organization, you still need development and operations to work more closely together. So, um, so again, if you start to look at the steps down the waterfall and you say, okay, instead of testing being, you know, the bottom step or next to the bottom step, maybe we put testing in the middle of the waterfall, mm. right? So that, so that we can move it further up or we move security further up the waterfall. And at the end of the day, does that become a migration towards agile software development? Maybe. Um, is it part of a slower migration in terms of cultural change? Maybe. Does it accomplish some of the benefits of DevOps? Absolutely. 